Good morning. And uh, as we study on marriage, so if you got invited today, like this is your first time, and now you're highly suspicious, like, uh, was I invited because I have marriage struggles? No, no, we're inviting people all the time. We're glad you're here. We're glad you're with us. Uh, um, uh, problem, you know, when you do a one-off sermon on marriage, you realize you could preach a whole year on it, and now you guys are like, we're never getting out of here. Um, no, we will, we'll get you guys out of here. Uh, a neighbor bumps into his neighbor, just like a typical Saturday morning, and, and pleasantries are exchanged. He says, hey man, how you doing? And he sees on the face of his neighbor, things aren't well. Man, how you doing? Uh, it's not good. What do you mean it's not good? He's like, man, you don't understand. It's just, it's just driving me insane. What's driving you insane? He goes, my floor. Your floor? He goes, the garage floor. I clean it, I scrub it, I, it's, just, it's just driving me insane. And the guy is, is listening, a little bit confused. He goes, what do you mean, your garage floor? He's like, you don't understand the amount of time and effort and work and sweat I put into this garage floor. And if I could just get that floor clean, I would be a happy guy. And the neighbor, not wanting to interrupt, is thinking, the floor's the problem. The, the floor's the problem. And before he can articulate this, before he can say, I don't think the floor's the problem, the neighbor goes, you know what? You know those new builds around the corner? Those new homes? Have you seen the floors in there? Pristine. Pretty nice. I'm thinking just getting rid of this one, getting a new one. And his neighbor's like, what? What? Are you guys tracking with this story at all? Yeah. It ain't the floor. It ain't the floor. I want to hit this. I want to hit this hard. This is the whole point of the sermon. Marriage problems are not really marriage problems. Marriage problems are not really marriage problems. We spend our life talking about the mess on the floor, failing to understand it's the car, you idiot. It's the unmaintained vehicle that is parking over the floor. An unmaintained car ruins a clean floor, just as an unmaintained heart will ruin a marriage. This is the point of the sermon. Marriage problems are not really marriage problems. They're heart problems. Marriage problems are not really marriage problems. They are sin problems. Marriage problems are not really marriage problems. They are faith problems. And I'm a guy who has asked for prayers over my marriage with people before. And I'm a guy who, in studying for this, goes, You idiot, you are complaining about the floors. Because it's, it's an understanding of our heart, our condition. Um, we got to know that marriage, it's where, it's where the mess of our lives falls and plays out. And, and I want to explain this in, in two ways. What we're going to do, we've, we've got the problem down. Okay, we're going to talk about the problem. Yeah, we're going to talk about the purpose of marriage. That's what I want to hit pretty hard, the biblical purpose of marriage. I want to quickly hit the process and we'll end in prayer. So they all start with P because that's what I do. But here, I, I want us to look at the biblical purpose of marriage. A biblical purpose of marriage, okay? Uh, and as I dive into this, give me a second because you may have an idea of where we should go in a study of marriage. I've, I'm going to say what you guys may not believe. We're going to Deuteronomy, okay? Um, marriage is work, right? You know, marriage, marriage requires some work. You guys are going to do some work today. We are going to be flipping through different sections of the Bible as we try to understand marriage, as we try to understand the bond of marriage. I am fully aware not everyone in this room is married. I'm also aware that this room is full of one big family. So a marriage problem, which isn't a marriage problem in one household, should affect all of this family and all of us should seek, should seek to strengthen that and help that problem. Um, so here we go, the, the purpose of marriage in Deuteronomy 6. And uh, I'm going to have one verse up here on the screen, but if you guys turn there. Um, and what you're, what you're looking at, if you're in Deuteronomy 6 and giving your fingers some time to find it, it's up near the front. Um, we have what's called the Shema prayer in verse 4 and 5. And um, what I have on the screen will be, I think it's the ESV. But verse 4 says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. 
We are going to hit this word one repeatedly here in a, in a few minutes, okay? The word one coming out of the Hebrew uh, is the word echad. And if you, you're trying to understand what this means, echad would mean one or unity. An interpretation of that would mean God is, is a whole. God is complete. God is unique. God is united. Some of your translations say the Lord our God, the Lord alone. That's pointing to that uniqueness. He's God alone. How are we seeing marriage in this? It's in that word, God. Because if we back up, you ready to get those thumbs moving? We're going to Genesis chapter 2. If we go to Genesis chapter 2, the same word, echad, and I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. I was just always told to pronounce Hebrew, just clear your throat while you're saying the word, and that's what I'm going with, okay? In Genesis chapter 2, verse 24, it says, this explains why a man leaves his father and mother, is joined to his wife, and the two are united into echad, into one. The Hebrew word meaning one, unified, whole, unique, united. The point of us being together, the point of us coming together is for that one. Okay? Now, now what we need to understand, um, woman was made from what? What bone of the man was the woman made from? Okay, I got rib across the board here. Where's your ribs at? Anatomy lesson. Where are ribs? Right here. Okay, now listen to me for a second. Men, the woman was not made from the bone at the bottom of your foot. Okay? She was made from the bone at your side. Ladies, you were not made from the bone at the top of the skull. Okay? You were made from the bone at the side to be united into one. That God, God is purposeful in what bone he chose to see us united shoulder to shoulder we are to be one. We are to be one. If, you've, if you're open there in Genesis 2, looking nearby, you'll see um, chapter 3, verse 16. And I, I'm, I'm not going to have this on the screen. Let me explain it. 3, 316, that's a pretty cool chapter and verse in the Bible. You, know, you guys know if you've been watching football, John 316. Okay? The very first 316 in the Bible, do you know what it refers to? See, the John 3.16, you guys all know. For God so loved the world, he gave his one and only son, that whoever should believe shall, shall have righteousness, shall have a life with him. But if we look at the first 3.16, this is what it is. God, the Lord, said to the woman, I will sharpen the pain of your pregnancy, and in pain you will give birth. This is right after the fall. This is right after sin. The Lord goes on. And you will desire to control your husband, but he will rule over you. This is what happens. Marriage, one chapter over, is described as unity, as oneness. And then all of a sudden, when we just throw a little sin in it, it's fallen apart. With sin comes the conflict. With sin comes the ability, we just want to tear up this union. With sin, the marriage falls apart. Marriage problems... They're sin problems. Marriage problems are one trying to push down the other, push over the other. We are united into one. We are united into one. And what we see here in, in that chapter 3, verse 16, the woman has a desire to control her husband. What's, a, what's an antonym of control? I'd say respect. I'd say submission. Submission. Can't even pronounce the word. Don't worry. And the man's going to rule over. He's going to have this, this desire to rule. What would be the opposite of rule? To serve, to love, to sacrifice. Are you seeing how marriage, designed as one, when we add sin, it falls apart? And so what we need to know here, the very first purpose for marriage is to display the Lord. The biblical purpose for a marriage bond is to display the Lord, to display the love of our Savior, to look at both of those 316s in context and realize there is a place for us to either love ourselves and people see the sin condition or a love for the Savior and people see the glory of God in there. Now, I've used two verses, but I think there's so much more that points to this. Some of you are going, I don't know. Let's just keep hitting the book. Move those fingers. Here we go. Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians 5, Gabe preached out of not too long ago. 
And in Ephesians 5, we're going to see that word one again and again. Uh, he, Paul talks through uh, the concept of marriage as it relates to the, the spiritual um, entity. And, and he says, he kind of recaps what he just said in two verses. He says, as the scriptures say, a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife. The two are united into one. He's pointing all the way back to Genesis. He describes the oneness this way. This is a great mystery. It's an illustration of the way Christ and the church are one. All right, so we had an image. We are to be image bearers of God, and when we are united together, in a way, we reflect the Lord, how he is Father, Son, Spirit, yet he is one. And in our marriage, we reflect the man and the woman as one. And now, Paul is saying, I want to add to this. You, in marriage, reflect Christ and the church. Do you guys realize what he is saying is rib from rib, side to side, Christ and the church are one. That we as men and women in a marriage bond, when we walk together, when we care for each other, how does Christ serve? He goes down. He washes feet. Men, how are you to serve? Down. Humble yourselves. Wash feet. You are to be a leader that leads from their knees. Okay? In all of this, verse 21, leading into this section, it says, Further submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. 521. Why is marriage to be united as one? Out of reverence for Christ. And here's the thing. I know some of you in your marriage are like, yeah, but, but he doesn't pick up his underwear off the floor. She's always nagging me about my underwear on the floor. Out of reverence for Christ. Out of reverence for Christ. Not where we typically go, but I want to hit it one more time to get this point through. Out of the words of Jesus in John 17, keep those thumbs moving. Out of John 17, Jesus is praying. He is praying for all believers. And in his prayer, he says, I'm not praying just for these disciples that were with him in person at that time. But also for whoever will believe in me through their message. Do you guys realize Jesus prayed for you? You guys right here have had the Lord praying for you. And here's this prayer. The prayer of Jesus for you. I pray that they will all be what? One. A reflection of God, the Father, and the Son, just as you and I are one. As you are in me, Father, I am in you, and may they be in us. So the world will what? Believe that you sent me. Do you recognize in your marriage bond, you can show a reflection of the unity we have in Christ? We don't, we don't think about it that way. We don't think about it that way because we get selfish because we're sinful and it becomes inward fighting and then we can write a book about his needs, her needs. And guess which part of that book I'm going to read? His needs, his needs, his needs. There's like half of that book I ignore. <laughs> but when I recognize we're to be one, and that the purpose of that one is to display the Lord, I don't have it on the screen. Let me read verses 22 and 23. Jesus says, I have given them the glory you gave me. That points back to Ephesians 5. We're connected. Christ and the church. I have given them the glory you gave me so they may be one as we are one. Jesus goes on in verse 23. He says, I am in them. You are in me. Here it comes. May they experience such perfect unity. I'm going to leave this cliffhanger. May they be so unified. So their love overflows. So they're the happiest people in the world. No, no. It says, may they experience such perfect unity that the world will know that you sent me. Do we think of our marriage in that framework? Not at all. Not at all. May they experience such perfect unity that the world will know that you sent me and that you love them as much as you love me. All right. I feel like if there was a way to put this to the test. Like this is, this is I like this idea of the Bible. It's a good book. And it's saying, make your marriage about displaying the Lord. But I was wondering, you know, would there be a couple that's run the gauntlet through this? 
that made their purpose displaying the Lord? What if we could find someone that had been married for a really long time? What if we found someone that held the Guinness Book World Record for the longest marriage? They're coming up. This is the teaser. How long do you think the longest marriage is? Any guesses? Did you say 150? It, it may feel like 150 years. Goodness. This is why I enjoy involving you guys, because who knows where it's going to go. I'm just going to just ignore, ignore any other answers. We're going to go right here. The world record for the longest marriage, Herbert and Zelmira, you won't forget that name, Fisher, 86 years and 290 days. 86 years and 290 days. World record. But here's the thing. When you are married that long, people go seeking advice. They seek quotes. They want to ask you questions. So here is their best marriage advice. You guys ready? Here it is. Respect, support, communicate with each other. Be faithful, honest, and true. Love each other with all of your heart. Where did we go first when we were talking about marriage? Deuteronomy 6. What's verse 5 of Deuteronomy 6? You must love the Lord with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength. We have Jesus repeat it later in Mark 12, that there is this, this completeness. It doesn't mean you got to check those boxes. It means love each other completely. 86 years. But what else do they got? What, what about the bad? Anyone here been married and had a bad day? Don't point to your spouse. Anyone had some rough times in marriage? Anyone had some days that were really not well in marriage? Okay. Funny I'm the only one that's just keeping their hand up. The rest of you just slowly put it up and dropped it down. Okay. All right. Are you ready for some advice from Zelmira? I already forgot his name. It doesn't, it's not as cool. Um, but here's their advice on a bad day. Remember, marriage is not a contest. Never keep score. God has put the two of you, what? What, what did they say? The two of you together on the same team to win. Are you telling me 86 years of experience and they said it's about being one? That tracks with the Bible. Way to go, guys. Way to go. And so what we have here, the purpose, the biblical purpose for a marriage bond is to display the Lord. Real talk for a second. Um, freshman year of college, first or second week, a bunch of us are all going to go meet up in the athletic center. We're going to play some volleyball indoors. And I see something out of my eye, because that's where you see things, out of your eye. And uh, this, this, this thing that has caught my attention, wearing short red shorts, black t-shirt, in athletic wear, we're playing volleyball. And I sit there and I go, man, I want to display the Lord. <laughs> display the Lord of that one. <laughs> Not a chance. You know, we, we would go back to the dorm room freshman year after, after hanging out in the big groups and be like, guys, which one of those gals do you want to display the Lord with? <laughs> that conversation never happened, at least not in my dorm. may have happened in a more mature one. We were in the immature dorm. We were talking other things, okay? All right, but guess what? Hey, I may have been there at the number one purpose. God still got me. He's got my back, okay? Through Paul, I'm about to show you scripture. Here was my purpose. Are you ready? Bam. It is better to marry than burn with lust, says Paul in 1 Corinthians 7, 9. Okay? And any of you in here, you know what I'm talking about. You didn't walk into a relationship going, who do I want to display the Lord with? It was, well, hello. <laughs> Howdy. You got my attention. For some of us, there was a visual attraction that guided us in that. So, so let me be honest here. There is another purpose, and it is biblical for walking into the relationship of marriage, and that is there are some desires that become fulfilled, okay? There may be some out there that they went after marriage for that number one reason. I would say they're more mature than me when I was. They may, they may be farther in the faith when I was at that time, but I saw red shorts, a smiling face, and I thought, I'm desiring something here. Let's go back to Genesis 2. The Lord God said... It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper who is just right for him. And every guy ever went, at last! <laughs> Whee! 
Okay, side note. There's times where you just read through scripture, and there's times when you just sit and kind of just, what does this mean? There is so much that we could think through on that phrase, at last, with Adam. Okay, think about it. He's, he's been created. He's with all the animals. Why is he exclaiming, at last? Think through this. I'm, I sat here. sat here for a week. At last, I no longer have to cuddle with the porcupines. At last, I no longer have to get my kisses from the cows. You know, at last, I no longer have to find an animal suitable for me to hold. You know, there's a, there's a whole lot of stuff that could happen at the last. And I will say this, for each of us, when we recognize our desires are met, there is an at last of the heart that is a prayer to the Lord. And some of you, your desire may not have been the lust aspect, it may not have been of the eyes, it may have been the fact that you really wanted to walk through this life with someone by your side. Listen, do you know why God chose to, to use the rib of Adam to bring, to bring Eve alongside? That's where you get it. That's where you get the pain, guys. That's where you get the pains when you're wrong. That's where you get the pains when you fail to lead. That's the, well, I'm going to say something in this sermon. Some of you guys are going to feel that missing rib today, okay? That's where God has got us as one, all right? Now, here is the thing. As we walk through this, I've got I've to say this because I'm not a fool here. When we talk about the biblical purpose of marriage for displaying the Lord and then desires being fulfilled, I know that this, this sermon can be frustrating for some people. Because this sermon can be frustrating because some of you have that desire and it's yet to be filled. Or some of you had that desire at one point and it faltered, it failed, and, and there was a divorce, there was a separation, there was those things. Some of you, this can be frustrating because you were married and it ended too soon, whether by a chosen break or, or life separation. See, and marriage can also be hard to talk about because I'm saying to some of you right now, display the Lord, and you're thinking, listen, God granted us this ball of flesh. We're just trying to keep it alive, okay? We ain't got time to focus on displaying the Lord. Marriage is hard because there's hu little humans that are always watching, always there, always knocking on the door. I remember the first time as a dad, I was like, I just need some alone time. And I shut the door, and I look, and all of a sudden there's like hands creeping under the doorway. And I was like, they're never going away, are they? <laughs> and in the midst of parenting, marriage can take a back seat, and you can have a whole lot of struggles, to which you'll say, man, I've got marriage problems. No, there's priority problems. And here's the, here's the priority. When we talked last week about the bond between parent and child, we've got to understand we can never forget all of us remain children to an almighty father. And when we're in the midst of raising kids, when we're in the midst of trying to keep these little humans alive, you know, whatever your parenting strategy is, we have to pause in the midst of our marriage and say, you know what, I'm the child. I'm the child of an almighty Lord. And when I work on that relationship, the marriage relationship, the parenting relationship are going to work out so much better. Uh, for those of you that, that you're looking at this, and, and you're seeing display the Lord, but you haven't quite gotten there. You're, you're kind of stuck in number two. And it's, again, a, it, marriage is kind of a battle back and forth of who vacuumed the carpet last. You know, who took out the trash last? Who, and there's this weird thing. And, and I want to say, if you want a better marriage, seek the better purpose. Some of you, you will be stuck in, in a frustrating cycle of marriage because it's all built upon desires. If he would just be attuned to my emotions. And the guy's thinking, if she would just take her clothes off. <laughs> Listen, if we get stuck at number two, there's, there's problems. There's problems. But if we seek that greater purpose, those desires in a roundabout way, because we're pursuing a love for God, fall into place and seem to be taken care of. I need to prove that. Can I prove it? Let me bring up my special guests again. Talking about that 86 years of marriage, saying, what, what did you have in common? What was your special sauce? What was the secret? We're both Christians. We believe in God. 
Marriage is a commitment to the Lord. We pray with and for each other every day. There is the special sauce. There is what will keep a marriage healthy. When you make it about you, when it's the selfish desires, you're living your marriage out of Genesis 3.16, and you're going to be battling. You're going to be struggling. But if you live out of that greater purpose, that is Genesis 2.24, seeking to be one, seeking to be as God's design, to display his glory, to display his holiness, things will go well. Here's how we get there. Here's how we get there. We've got to check our heart gap. And let me, let me explain this for a second. Because there is, there is some of you that in your marriages you cannot get to that number one, display the Lord. And here's why. Because one of you does not care, is not even heartfelt desire for the Lord. Is that making sense? You've been, as, as the Bible would say, unequally yoked. You have attached the ribs to someone that is not attached to the Lord. 1 Corinthians 6.14 says, Do not, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers, and there is no place that is more important than marriage. So what we need to do, if, if you're there, if that commitment has been made, the goal then is to share the love you have for the Lord with the one you're attached to in an effort for them to come to know the Lord, to grow in the Lord. You cannot seek a greater purpose alone. And so all of a sudden, you have made a commitment for someone to come in to know the Lord. But if you want your spouse to love you more, selfish, what if we switch that? If you wanted to love your spouse more, that's a better way of looking at it. Love God more. If you want to love your spouse more, love God more. And what I mean by that, our love for God should be so far above our love for a spouse that it's just going to flow outwardly to them. Our love for God is going to be there. When, when we hear the word holy about our Father, our Holy Father, that means He is set apart. Which that means it's not I love God and then I love my spouse and those are, are there. No, no, no. It's I love God and outside of the list on a completely other sheet of paper is, is your spouse. That the love for God is so far away from your love for spouse that that is what flows out into your marriage. And I want to say this and I want to be careful in how this same because it's going to hurt some of you people. Frankly, you love your spouse more than you love the Lord. And you have turned your spouse into an idol. Some of you, you love your kids more than you love the Lord. You have turned your own children into idols. Some of you love yourself more than you love the Lord. You have cast yourself into that golden calf, into that idol. To love the Lord is to set everything else separate and far beyond. Let me explain how Jesus says this. In Matthew 10, 37, he says, Whoever loves son and daughter more than me is not worthy of me. See, but we feel good about loving our kids, right? He says, if you love them more than me, you're not even worthy. And in Luke 14, 26, he says, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother, spouse, Children, siblings, they cannot be my disciple. Are we to hate those family relations? No. In relation, in comparison to our love for God and our love for anyone else, it's so far apart that one looks like hatred. Check your heart gap with your love for the Lord and anyone else you're in relationship with. And when your love for the Lord far and away exceeds other people, it will benefit your marriage. All right? We've got our purpose. Our purpose is to display the love of God, display the Lord, and for desires to be met. God knew we had desires. He sought to make them well. And here's the thing. Let me, let me tack this on. If you are in a current marriage and, um, and, and things are not fantastic, okay, you, you guys got me here? If you are currently married and things are not fantastic, if things are not a round of applause for the Lord for your marriage, okay? 
Uh, if you, and let me, let me say this in a way where some of it, it helps. If you are currently married and intimacy is not something where you cry out hallelujah to the Lord, the problem is you've added someone else to your bed. Okay? So, so what I mean, the marriage bed meant for one, a husband and wife connected, connected together. You have to ask yourself, if things are not amazing, who else is in your bed? Because some of you, you come with your spouse to bed and you bring uh, anxiety. Anxiety gets to hop in the bed with you. Uh, some of you, you get into bed with your spouse and resentment is right there with you. You know what I'm talking about? Some of you, you get into bed and, and you have avoidance. You're like, how far can I get to the edge of the bed? Or you know what? Couch sounds fantastic. That's where I'm going. Who else is in your bed? And there's some we don't even think about. You add exhaustion to your bed. Listen, guys, if your wife is too exhausted for you know what I'm talking about, maybe you need to help her not be exhausted. Care for her in a way that she doesn't end her day absolutely exhausted. See what you can to make her day easier. Imagine bringing your wife to bed full of energy and another guy gives a fist pump in his heart right now. Okay. Listen, here's simply what I'm saying. If, if in your marriage someone's got the hot head, you're going you're gonna to have a cold bed. Okay? If someone in your marriage is spiritually unfed, you're going to have a cold bed. We need to recognize that the love for God plays out in that intimacy that the Lord wants for us. We've got the purpose. Let me hit the process. From 33 of Ephesians 5, Paul says, I'm saying it again. Each man must love his wife as he loves himself. The, the wife must respect her husband. Here's the marriage process. It's simply put in Ephesians 5, 33, love and respect. It's, it's alluded to back in uh, Genesis 3, 16. The sin that causes those things to falter, the sin that causes those things to fall apart, love and respect. Uh, Dr. Emerson sat around for years after years doing marital counseling as a minister. He'd sit there with his Bible open. He'd sit there with people talking through their marriage. And he said one day after every single time, it seems like, Lord, why is there so many problems? Lord, why is there so many problems? That he's just sitting there and looks and sees, it's been so simple this whole time. See, what he was doing was trying to fix floor problems rather than dealing with the actual Problems, And this is what he says is open. I finally saw a connection. Without love from him, she reacts without respect. Gentlemen, how's that feel when you're disrespected? Without respect from her, he reacts without love. Dr. Emerson calls it the crazy cycle, and he sees it going around and around and around. And in his one book, he talks about how you break that cycle, how you live biblically in your marriage. And I will tell you this. Any ladies here that are married that like to be loved? Is that a thing for you? Some half-hearted hands there. There we go. Gentlemen, any of you guys want to be respected in your marriage? I got head nods instead of hand raising. I like that. <laughs> I've got some unmarried men. Just, yes, that would be fantastic. <laughs> Checking you out all in the back there. Um, but here's, here's something. There is times I have talked with couples. It could be out in public and, and you know, whether it's, it's um, in counseling. And I'll say something talking about marriage. And one of them will say something along the lines of, oh, we never have any problems. Or, uh, you, you know, we never really disagree. Um, we never fight. This is fun if they're both there. If one of them's there, it's not as fun. But when both are there, this is fun. Because with one, one says it with their mouth, and the other's usually denying it with their face. You know, like, like the gal say, like, oh, we never fight. And the guy's back there like, oh, oh yeah. Um, the funny thing, when I hear those kind of things, ha, um, you know the old MacGyver shows, that line, hey, it's going to explode, or any, any action movie? It's going to explode. What does everyone do? They run away. That's what I'm thinking when I hear those in relationships. Oh, we never fight. We never disagree. We never have problems. I'm thinking, get away. This thing's going to blow. This thing's going to blow. And here's how it's going to happen. It's either going to happen one of them that's been bottling stuff in is going to absolutely blow up at the other one. Or one of them internally is going to blow up on themselves. They're going to go into a dark, terrible place internally, and it's going to be an internal explosion. And so we've got to understand, if, if we're not aware that, yeah, problems do happen, and to check our heart, to check those things, they will continually happen. We will continually be in a crazy 
cycle, we need to, out of a love for the Lord, love our spouse. We need to, out of a respect for the Lord, respect our spouse and watch that take off. One more one. I'm only giving you you guys two um, um, practical tools because they're simple, easy, and amazing. A lot of you have heard of Gary Chapman's five love language. Quick refresher. Um, If you were to say, I love you to your spouse, and you were to constantly bring her gifts, you know, I'm bringing her flowers, I'm bringing her chocolates, I'm bringing her, that may never work if she does not care about gifts. That may never work if all she really wants is to be with you, to be side by side with you. Gary Chapman points, hey, there's five love languages. Hopefully that's clear enough for you guys to see. Words of affirmation, quality time, physical touch, acts of service, and receiving gifts. You've got to understand your wife's love language, okay? There would be no point for me to come home and speak French to Jen. She'd be like, even if I was saying the most wonderful things in the world, it would mean nothing. But also, and and I will use us as an example, if Jen were to say, hey, I bought you a new shirt, my response would be, okay. If she were to say, hey, you look good in that shirt, I'd be like, what? (laughs) And if she were to say, hey, you need to take that shirt off, I'd be, (laughs) bing! Listen, we all talk in different love languages. If you don't know your spouse's love language, things are always going to be off. You know? If you're going out of your way to do good things for your wife, and she's like, the best thing you could do for me is just sit your butt down next to me. That's how you can show love to me. And we've got to understand what love language. The beautiful thing, it'll take you, it's not hard. Look for the book. Look for ways online to find your love language. Just talk to each other. That'd be the easiest way. Hey, of those five love languages, which one mean the most to you? And hopefully one of you are lucky enough to have a spouse that says all five. (laughs) All five. Know your love language. Know your spouse. Um, End in with this part of the process, and then we'll enter into prayer. I know not everyone in this room is married, so the next slide I'm going to put up, it entails not only marriage, but life. If you are in this room and you are single, if you are in this room and you don't care about marriage, if you're in this room and you're like, I would love to be married, if you're in this room and marriage is in the rearview mirror and you're walking along life solo, this still applies to life as we know it. And, oh, blanks, bummer. Okay. Each of you know in a given day kind of the way you pursue things. I'm going to tell you what you'll end up finding. If you are seeking happiness, you're going to find hurt and you're going to find heartache. Now, now listen, you may find a moment of happiness and then it's going to go away. If you are really seeking happiness in your marriage, you will always be in a grass is greener mentality. And it's going to hurt and it's going to cause heartache. You're going to look online, social media, whatever, and be like, they're smiling, they love each other, why do I have this here? And happiness you will never truly find if that's what your end goal is. For those of you that are single, for those of you, if it's happiness you're after, you are going to constantly get hurt. If I could just have a mate, I would be happy. I'm going to tell you this, welcome to heartache land there's something better. If you pursue holiness, you'll find hope and happiness. Now listen to me here. If you pursue holiness, that doesn't mean that's the ticket and marriage will happen. But you will find a wholeness and a contentment from and in the Lord that'll let you feel whole, that'll give you hope, that'll give you happiness. Now listen, as we pursue holiness, happiness isn't the end goal, but we experience it along the way. As we pursue holiness, as we walk to the Lord, we will find those treasures that God provides along the way. My marriage advice every single time since working in youth ministry, college ministry, is go after the Lord, pursue the Lord, and then as you're going after the Lord, running after him, look to your right and left, see who's there. Not to go fishing for a mate. To go after the Lord. Some of you are like me, An earlier desire has you in the current, the current relationship you're in. And I am telling you, you can improve it tremendously by changing the purpose. If it is about you and getting your desires felt, you're going to come up short. 
If it's about becoming happy, you're going to get hurt. But if in your marriage you are pursuing the Lord, if you are pursuing His holiness, you are going to find hope and happiness. Uh, Terry, come up for a second for our agreed upon discussion. Uh, as he's coming up, uh, who, who in here has been married over 10 years? There's a lot of hands. Good job. Okay, keep them up. Who in here has been married over 15 years? It's kind of a check. I want to see if the, the spouse's hands go down at the same time. Who in here has been married over 20 years? Okay. Who in here has been married over 25? Still got some. Who in here has been married over 30? All right. Who in here has been married 40 years? We got a few up. That's pretty cool. 40, 41, 42, 43, 44, 45, 46, 47. 48, 49, 50, 51, 52, 50, I'm loving this by the way, this is a lot of fun for me, 53, 54, 55, 56, we got some winners right here, Harry and Ernie, how many years has it been? How many, is it 50? <laughs> yeah. 60 years. Harriet, confirming. Has it been 60 years? It needs celebrated. Um, we're ending with prayer, and this is how I want to do it. We're going to make it a mobile prayer. We're going to have you guys getting up and moving around a little bit. For those of you that have been married less than 10 years, I want you to flock to a, a couple that's been married the longest. You got me? In a second, we'll all stand up. Um, I'm going to have you guys heading over there. Ernie and Harriet, they're going to surround you with prayer. At the same time, if you two would just be praying for those that surround you, for those that have been married under 10 years. In a second, I'm going to have us all stand up. If you wish you could be married, if you're like, marriage is something I want, marriage is something I desire, I want you guys just, who in here is one, not long, no longer married, but just seeks marriage, find a partner to be in prayer with, and I'm giving you this prayer. Are you ready? For those of you that have been married, whether it's one year or 60 years, here's the prayer. My marriage needs help, Lord, because I'm in it. Okay? You can say, that's a silly... No, no, no. That's the prayer. My marriage needs help, Lord, because I'm in it. And may my commitment be to you. Um, I'm going to have you guys stand up. We're going to pray together for a second here. Get on up. Some of you guys are right now not knowing where to go. If you are a married couple and you see someone that's been married not long as you find them and just surround them. If you are a young couple and you see someone in this room that you know has been married and, and just, fly, honestly, start moving, folks. Start moving. Here we go. Find a couple to be married with and we're going to sing the next song wherever you end up at. For those of you that would love to be married and you see a couple that's been married, go find them. Go surround them. I'm going to... I feel like this is marriage right now. Something's said and nothing's done, okay? Some of you listen, some of you don't, okay? Find another couple, find another group, gather them and pray with them.